name is Bruce Campbell. Uh, I have an exhibition at the Yellow Box Gallery. This is a video document of the art that's in the gallery right now. Uh, this image, it's rather uh, uh, glossy, is of a, uh, a picture taken of a pastel I did in the 1970s. Um, it's a pastel of a bridge in my hometown. Um, and uh, as this uh, video is being recorded, that bridge is being taken apart. The bridge no longer exists. And I thought it a very uh, very apt thing to put in the show because the show is about time and about impermanence, but specifically because I use that image in an ad in the 80s on the back cover of Arts Atlantic, a uh, local art journal for Atlantic Canada. And it's, uh, it's a vanity ad, and it begs the question of, uh, of an artist looking for attention. I wanted people to see the painting, and I got tired of waiting to be invited for a show, and, and then the uh, vicissitudes of getting a, a, uh, a review. So I simply bought the back page, and the text says, Have you seen this picture? There's the picture. To the left of the picture is a little cut line describing it. And it says, the whereabouts of these works are now unknown, and even their survival is a matter of conjecture. Um, and then here is an image of the bridge uh, currently being deconstructed. And you can see the center span is now apart. It's by uh, the, a friend of mine, uh, Clifford Morrison, took the picture. This is a, an image, a virtual photo of a, of a, a large piece I'm doing. It's a, it's a paint cube. It's a solid... Uh, a solid painting that, that exists in three dimensions. This is a virtual image of the uh, layers that are to be found in, in the paint cube. I'm doing two of them. One records sunsets, one records sunrises. Um, this is the text that describes the, the painting that's in the gallery, paint cube number 16. It's one cubit high, two cubits wide, and one cubit uh, 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 across the practice. I go into my garden at 6 p.m., always from the same spot I face southwest, in a visual sweep of my left, south to my right, west, and from the horizon directly in front, zero degrees, to directly above 90 degrees, I look to the sky and choose a color. And I order the paint from my sponsor. And then that paint is poured into the cube and allowed to dry. And when I'm in the right frame of mind, I repeat the process. And here is the box that the paint is being poured in. It's a, an art crate. It's, it's built like a crate to carry art. And this is the last layer that was poured into it. A nice, uh, sunset color and there's a little few squares down there. I'll get close. That's where I dug an insect out. Poor little insect got trapped in there when it was drying and I want pure paint. I don't want any uh, extra protein in there so I just uh, dug it out. So shortly we're going to pour another layer in the gallery. This is a little piece of pie that I made. It's it's a record. It's a, a secondary um, piece mirroring uh, the sunrise cube that I'm doing. And if we match the painting up, you can see that ballistically it matches, uh, like a ballistic test, it matches the layers of the colors in the big paint cube. And you can see that uh, the layers that match are at the very beginning of the cube. And there's all the layers. And because I'm doing it, the sun rise at 6 in the morning, I'm in the dark and in the light. In the summer I'm in the light, and in the winter I'm in the dark. Um, oh, there we are. This is a self-portrait. Um, and you can see that I sign my name uh, right there. It's kind of ghosting through that sign on the back of the glass. So if you've ever done a self-portrait and you, you're basically looking into a mirror, so your self-portrait ends up being a reflection and what's on the left is actually on the right and what's on the right is on the left. So to correct that, uh, to do a proper self-portrait from your perspective, you have to be on the inside of the glass, if you will, on the other side. So um, one of the pieces I've done in a lot of performances dealing with uh, through the looking glass, and, and this is quite literally a self-portrait, 
signed on the back of the glass, dated on the front, so it's uh, through the looking glass, if you will. Uh, here's a piece, I've done these for a long time. Uh, I haul out these cute little chestnuts when I need to, when I'm having a show. Uh, uh, a pithy little comment on materialism. This is a set rat trap, uh, and it's painted delicately until there's enough paint to hold it. Uh, so if you've picked away at the layer of paint on here, right at the bait, which is glitter, uh, that trap will will come apart. And because it's um, because it's a, a solid uh, a, a rat trap, it will really bruise your hand if if you're holding it when it goes off. These are. Polar bears and snowstorms, uh, uh, I did a hundred of them, just little dingbats, like painting apples for the teacher. So I did, uh, I did a hundred of these, I'm not going to do any more of this size at least, and the last uh, ten of them I put most traps on them, um, because I, I wanted to make a little comment on materialism and the, uh, the dangers of putting too much stock into owning a discrete object, as precious as they are, and as much as I like to collect them, uh, it is a, it, collecting any object is a form of materialism. So I just wanted to make a, a little comment that, that, that addresses that. Here are my bicycle, uh, one of my bicycle playing cards. Uh, it's based on the United States Playing Card Company's bicycle playing card. It's a very famous playing card. The company gave me a, a, a copyright release to do it. I made a stencil. Now I'll get up close. The paint is really thick because when I paint, I'm making an object. And I want my objects to be not an illusion uh, of something else, but objects by themselves and of themselves. I don't know what, what's happening with the focus, but they're very, very, very sculptural. So where's my hand here? They're, they're really nubby and rich with paint. Um, okay, so that's a bicycle playing card and it's uh, framed with uh, some polar bears and snowstorms. And so I'm doing a suite of political works. This is one of them. It's uh, not for sale, but if you happen to buy it, then you give the money to a charity of my approval and you get the tax receipt. But it says, um, under free trade, the legal rights and protections won by labor have been forgotten. And here is an image of a young coal miner at 1900. And beside that person is a garment factory worker or a machinist in Bangladesh or Pakistan and somewhere where, um, in both instances, 12-year-old uh, or 10-year-old children are, are doing work. And <coughs> in North America, um, labor fought for legal protection to prevent such exploitation, but under free trade, uh, capital is allowed to move across borders, but the covenants that are tied to the profit of that capital haven't transferred with free trade. I think free trade is a bit of a misnomer because all that's able to move across border is capital. Um, the, the rights and protections the human rights and protections to protect us against the um, the inhumanity vicissitudes of corporatism are not transferred at the same time. So it's it's something I think needs to be globally addressed. That uh, if Canadian capital or American capital from let's say a, uh, an asbestos company goes to uh, India, the rights and protections that we have won uh, against that surplus capital, that profit, should be able to be transferred to those workers that are now handling the same product um, in a foreign country. So the, the, I'm doing th works like that between the layers of paint, if you will. I have um, a series of cards, and they are cards from the 70s that were created uh, by a, um, uh, they were created for transfer to a slide, and then the slides were used in a presentation uh, given to salespeople that were selling products. So we'll just review these and I think uh, we'll end the tape at that. Finding space. And when I, when I pan these, just think between uh, a gallery, being an artist, what it is to be in a gallery, and if you're not an artist, uh, think of what it is to sell or your time or labor, what ha have you. Best location. Loss prevention, 
the store, the supplier, the consumer. Resources, time, money, people. Customer identification. My name is Bruce Campbell. I'm the artist that has a show at, currently up at the Yellow Box Gallery. Uh, the, the central piece in the show is uh, Pink Cube number 16, which is, uh, records uh, sunset colors taken from my garden, and uh, we're going to pour a layer. So uh, come on in close, and I'll show you the process. It's uh, very basic. It's, it's, I'm going to mix paint, and it's just like uh, mixing batter. I have um, two cans of paint here. Um, and the layer, this layer of paint is big enough that it's going to require two quarts of paint. And you'll see these cans of paint have been standing for a little bit of time, so the color has uh, started to settle. Um, I'm going to pour the paint into this. I'm going to whisk it, mix it, so the colors are, are good. I'm adding, a this is not product placement, but I'm adding a specific uh, millimeter of water, about 200 millimeters of water to each can, so I'm going to add 400 millimeters of water to this mix, because uh, the viscosity of the paint has to be just right. It can't be too thick and it can't be too thin. I'm going to be tickling the paint to the sides of the, uh, of the cube inside to pr produce a uniform layer uh, across, and there's a capillary action that happens where the paint uh, uh, sticks to the side of, 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 um, of the cube. Come on through. Uh, in many ways, uh, it can be say, said that this, uh, this, this uh, art form is, is, is as exciting as watching paint dry. for the magic ingredient, water. Just so happens that conveniently the uh, Coca-Cola uh, bottle has a, has a line at the 200 milliliter uh, level. I discovered this. Uh, and uh, it's just a very convenient, uh, convenient measure. So this, uh, uh, I uh, mixed uh, the water in the cans, shaking the cans uh, to get all the, all the good in this out, all the paint. What's interesting is that the, 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 there's an evolution in, in uh, the formulas for paint. So as the paint becomes more and more environmentally friendly, um, the, uh, the properties of the paint uh, change. So, so uh, I've already had to go uh, into a second formula. If you look at the empty cans, there's two types of labels. And uh, pretty soon I'll be into a third, which, uh, so I have to learn the, um, properties of each new formula. And, uh, although I don't think the amount of water will change the next formula, uh, the, the, the behavior of the paint, the way it dries, uh, definitely changes. bad for cans that have been sitting for a long time. The color is fairly, uh, fairly uh, consistent. So here we go. Um, into a carpeted area with a bowl full of paint. <laughs> okay, here we go. Now we're going to pour a layer. Okay. La 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 So I want to get all the paint out before I tickle the paint to the sides of the cube. And I've poured the paint into the cube and I'm looking for a particular um, uh, 
a behavior of paint now. Um, what I want is the paint to adhere uh, in an even manner all the way along. So right here it's kissed the edge nicely and you can see there's a little bit of yellow showing so I want the paint to uh, just be above that. I want a layer of paint just above that. And the, the paint by virtue of its own inherent properties will uh, will, will, will uh, behave in a certain way. Once you, once you know your paint you can, it will you're one with its behavior. So uh, just watch what I do. I'm, I'm going to get all the paint to the edge as close as I want it. As close as I can get it without making it touch. Right now. On all sides because I, I just don't want to um, spend a lot of time with this. I'll do, I'll do the, uh, get the paint to the edge now. And it will self, self, self level and in a building like this which is relatively uh, new the uh, floors are level uh, so it's going to be a pretty good layer of paint, a pretty level layer of paint here. So judging by the color here I can't remember the exact uh, color of the sky when I, when I chose this particular color but knowing that it was done in Antigonish and if it follows this fiery yellow uh, chances are very good that it was a, um, a rainy night or a foggy night. Most likely rain and that's the color that was in the sky uh, when, I, when I chose it. And the interesting thing is I can never I choose to forget the colors as soon as I, I pick them. So there's not uh, I don't have a memory, there's no real predetermination of, of uh, manipulation, of color manipulation. Yeah. Okay, so you can see uh, from the, uh, the layer of paint in here now, it's pretty well uniform. Uh, and now I'm going to push the paint to the sides. And, and uh, I don't know if you'll see it, but it behaves in a very particular manner. And uh, in, in this extreme corner, you'll see a little bit of debris. I'm going to get a needle and get that out of there because I don't want that in there, especially at a corner. And there are air bubbles in there, which are now... Um, they're now uh, uh, bursting, if you will. Yeah, a little wave. There, see that? Oh. And they join up. So you get an even layer. It's, it's, it, it will be even. Okay. Uh, when the cube comes out of the mold, the sides can be scraped. Um, So one ends up with a very, very uh, accurate layer thickness. In a few minutes I'll finish uh, this layer and I'll let it dry and between this layer and the next layer I'm going to be out in the garden running around having a great time. Okay.